This is Jamie from Stillmeyer Games, and today I'm going to talk about my top 10 favorite gateway game recommendations. So gateway game, I'll go more into the definition as I talk about these games, but overall, I view a gateway game um, as a game that, uh, that a non-gamer, someone who has not played many or any modern tabletop games, uh, can have a good time with and might open their eyes to playing more modern hobby tabletop games. Although it also might be the only modern tabletop game they ever played. This might be they ended up at a gathering, a group um, where they, they weren't expecting to play something other than like a very light party game. And, uh, and this is a, these are games that I, I would recommend introducing to, the, to these, these non-gamers. Or people who just who really want to be gamers uh, or want to get into modern hobby games but haven't played them yet. So with that said, let me jump right into the list. I'm going to start out with my one Stillmeyer Games recommendation. I, I think other games that we have are, can, be, can work for this, but I try to only put one of our games on these lists. And that is Between Two Cities. Uh, Between Two Cities is a game where you are working together with a player on your right to build a 4x4 city, and you're working together with a player on your left to also build a 4x4 city. And at the end of the game, um, you will only score your lowest scoring of your two cities. So you're trying to do well with both cities, and you're doing that by, you can kind of see them in the back of the box here, you're doing that by drafting tiles. Drafting, if you're not familiar with that term, means that you are taking a, a hand of tiles and you are selecting two of them, and then you're passing the rest to the next player. Uh, and then you're working together with these players on your left and your right to select which tile goes in this city and then which tile goes in this city. Uh, this game, I have found, works really, really well as a gateway game for a number of different reasons. A, being that there aren't many, many rules to, to remember. B, there are reference cards. I think reference cards are something missing from a ton of games that could otherwise be gateway games. But the reference cards, uh, we, we include them. Let me see if I have examples here. Nope, I don't have them handy. But uh, they let you, if, if you don't remember how a tile scores, uh, you can just look at the reference card. But also in Between Two Cities, we include the scoring on the tiles themselves. Basically, we're not asking you to remember anything. And I think that can be a daunting thing for new players. You still need to explain the rules, but instead of expecting a player to remember the different actions they can take, or remember what the scoring mechanisms mean or what the icons mean, you have it right here on the card or on the, on the tile, and we have it on the reference card as well. Uh, the other thing that I think that makes this a really welcoming gateway game is that is the collaboration between the player on the right and player on the left. It means that if you have a few people at the table, or even just one person at the table who knows the game really well, um, that sense of collaboration with other people can really help to guide you or guide a new player through the experience of playing Between Two Cities. Uh, for that reason, there will be some some fully cooperative games on this list. This is what I would call it's really a competitive game, but it does it feels semi cooperative because you are working together with other players to achieve your own victory condition. So I think Between Two Cities is a fantastic gateway game if you're looking to introduce someone to the modern uh, hobby game, the modern world of hobby games. At number nine, I have Codenames, and remarkably, I should comment on this list. Usually, when I do these top ten lists. I own maybe a couple of the games on this on this list. I own all 10 of the games on this list because I like to have games handy that I can introduce to new gamers. And this one that I haven't actually opened, you can see it's in shrink, because I, I haven't played Codenames Deep Undercover many times. I've usually played the standard version of Codenames, and over the last year I've been playing the online version of Codenames. But Codenames is a fantastic game to share with people who are unfamiliar with the modern hobby game market. Um, in Codenames, you uh, work with a team, so the teamwork element helps you have other people supporting you, to give clues about words on a grid. So you're giving a, a, a clue um, to, to one person on your team to try to help them guess uh, a certain number of words on this grid. And you are doing this in such a way so that uh, they can ideally guess more than one word at a time, but they don't guess the wrong word. For example, on the table... Uh, this is this is the after dark version. So there are some words that that are have a lot of innuendos on them. But there's the word melons and there's the word clam on here. Um, among the other ones are commando, motorboat, keg, and sheep. But we have melons and clam. And if I'm trying to get you to guess a couple of these words, I might say food two. And what that means to you is that there's uh, two different words on this on this on the table somewhere that I want you to guess that are related to food. And you might hopefully guess melons and clam as a result of doing that. 
it's really, really easy to play. Uh, if you are not comfortable being in the spotlight and having to choose those words, you can even just choose a one word. Like, like in that case of melons, you could, if you can't think of that word food, you could just say fruit one. You could choose a one word clue if you want. Um, and that is totally fine to do in, in code names. You probably won't win, but you can still experience the game and have fun with it. Um, I have introduced this at family reunions and people have had a lot of fun with it at, at family reunions. Uh, and I, I think it's a great introductory game into the, 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 the world of, of modern hobby games. That's number at code names. I have at number nine and number eight, I have the newest addition to this list. And that is dice miner. Dice Miner is a fantastic dice drafting game where you have this mountain of dice. You can see it on the back of the box here. You have this mountain of dice, these beautiful custom dice. I think aesthetics and art and theme uh, can really help make a game welcoming for the right person. Not everyone wants to be a, uh, a, a dwarven miner in a, in a fantasy realm, but those who do, I really enjoy this. But you have these beautiful custom dice that you are picking off from this, this mountain and uh and gaining the the resulting benefits uh typically at the end of the round when you score these these uh these dice there's two things that i think are really really good for for gateway games uh, other than just the beautiful colors of the dice gameplay is very simple on your turn you're just collecting the die um uh and uh oh, what was the, the second thing I'm, I'm trying to remember the first uh but the the and the, there's that and at the end of every round in addition to scoring your dice you then get to roll all of your dice and i think that is just fun i think that's fun for anyone any any type of gamer but if you're a new gamer it's a lot of fun to just pick up a bunch of dice and roll them and see what happens and it means that uh while there is a lot of agency in the game that means uh your your range of choices your ability to make choices that impact your uh your 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 game um your strategy, there's also an element of luck there. You're rolling a bunch of dice and maybe you'll get something good, maybe you, you won't get something great, but you can craft your strategy for that round around those dice that you roll. The one thing holding this game back a little bit from being higher up on this list is that it doesn't include the reference guide that I mentioned earlier in the video. I think a reference guide reminding players what these different icons mean would be incredibly helpful. However, it is pretty easy to remember them. And at any given time, there's only a few dice available on the mountain anyway, because you can only pick from the top of the mountain. And so if a player forgets, it's very easy to say, okay, that die means this, and that die means this. Which one do you want? Um, but I do think a reference guide would have helped elevate this game into even higher on this list of gateway games. That said, Dice Miner is still a fantastic gateway game. At number, what is this, uh, seven, we have Sushi Go. This is Sushi Go Party. This is the main version made now. Um, there's actually, I think, almost too much stuff in this box for a gateway game, but um, it has a, a recommended variant, a recommended version of setup for beginners. Uh, this is another drafting game. I mentioned drafting games earlier. And basically, you're getting a hand of cards. They're little cute sushi cards, um, and you are choosing one of those cards and then passing the rest of the cards to the next player and you put your card on the table and there's some end of round and end of game scoring um, for the different cards that you select the art the aesthetic of it is really cute the theme is very welcoming uh, the decisions you make are meaningful but they're also very simple in fact you can even make decisions really without thinking about it if you want if you're if you're learning the game and you don't know if this card is better than that card it's okay you can pick one of them and you'll still do fine and i think that's one of the really helpful things about these gateway games that um, the decisions you make early in the game are very low stakes in a lot of these games. Uh, you can make the decision that, that it moves you forward a little bit, it might be not be the best decision, but it doesn't impede your ability to have fun later in the game when you understand it better. I think that really helps with teaching and playing the game, especially since uh, a lot of these games you can actually teach as you play. People aren't sitting through a long rules explanation. You are explaining one or two basic things and then having everyone take a turn and guiding them through that turn a little bit. That makes these games really, really welcoming for new gamers. So Sushi Go, I don't even know if the basic version, I, I, the basic version is just Sushi Go, but Sushi Go Party is the version that I think is widely available now. That's number seven. At number six and five, I have two fairly similar games, but I think these push your luck games, like Deep Sea Adventure, work really, really well as gateway games. Deep Sea Adventure is just a tiny little box. It's so affordable. Um, and that's actually one nice thing about these games too. They're not super expensive. So if you want to introduce a game to someone in the hopes that they might actually go check it out and buy it, and they're not used to spending 50 to $100 on a, on a board game, a little game from Oink Games like Deep Sea Adventure is a great fit. In this game, you are diving down underwater and collecting treasures and you are deciding how much you how far you want to go before you need to turn back and get to the surface before you run out of air um, there's a random element in that you are rolling some dice on your turn and that determines how far you're moving 
and you have to decide before, at the beginning of your turn if you're going to continue moving down to get the better treasure deeper under the water, or if you're going to move that turn if you're going to go the opposite direction and move back up to the top. Uh, again, it's fairly low stakes. You can do terribly in the first round of this game and, and just and essentially drown underwater, which is not pleasant, but it's you know it's very abstract in this game. Um, you you can uh, you can drown and then come back and do much better in the second or the third round. You can also just push your luck and push your luck and have fun doing that and do terribly, or maybe you'll get a little bit lucky and grab that treasure, that really valuable treasure, and get out. And one of the really nice things about this game, I can't show you on the, on the screen because it's very difficult to set up, or, or not difficult to set up, but difficult to show, is that um, every round, all the treasures that were taken, these little treasure tiles that were taken by the other players, are removed from the line of treasures. And so it's much easier to get the more valuable treasures uh, as, as you play the second and third round of Deep Sea Adventure. It's a lot of fun. It's super easy to teach, super easy to get to the table. And it's one of these games, there's one of the other things that I think is good for all ages. I think of the, of the great gateway games of the world are good for anyone who, who just wants to try out um, a, a modern hobby game, not just those who, who are very experienced with this realm of games. Um, and, and, and oftentimes you, you might be introducing it to, to family where you have different, different people of different ages. And I think this works really well for different people of different ages. Uh, very no, especially since there's no text in the game. So you can do, introduce someone really young to the game. There's no hidden information even, um, and you can guide them through the game. That's Deep Sea Adventure number five. At number four, I have another Push Your Luck game. I was hesitant to put two on the list, but I really think that Ink and Gold is a great example of a modern game. Um, it's an older game, but this is the, the more modern version of it uh, that, uh, that is very welcoming for, for, for new gamers. In Ink and Gold, you are, again, pushing your luck. You're, you're kind of going into a cave, and you are deciding on your turn simultaneously with, with the other players if you want to go deeper into that cave or if you want to run out of the cave with the treasure and the gems that you've already accumulated. Um, and, and then after you've made that decision, you reveal a card that shows if there's more treasure to be had and split among the players who remain in the cave, or if there is a bad thing, a catastrophe that happens that may not be all that terrible unless another card of that catastrophe has already appeared. So if you have a fire card come up, one fire card come up, nothing bad happens except you don't get more treasure. But then that means that every time you go a little deeper into the cave, you're risking seeing another fire card. And if you do, you burn up and you lose all the treasure that you gathered that round. So there's this really nice, again, push your luck element of, of deciding how far into this cave do I want to go. And I think that is just very welcoming to new gamers. It means that even though you have interesting decisions to make, that, um, that you can have fun and do well thanks to a little luck in your first experience in the game. And it still has some really nice modern game mechanisms in it. So I think Ink and Gold is, is a great game to introduce to new people. It's very easy. I've taught this game so many times. It's so easy to steer people through Ink and Gold and, and let them know what their decisions mean as they're going from turn to turn. So yeah, Ink and Gold number five. At number four, I have the one game that could be considered a party game on this list. I think it's the first cooperative game on the list. But... Uh, but it works so well for all sorts of gamers. So if you have a group of some gamers, but also some new gamers, I think Just One is a fantastic game to get to the table. This is a cooperative game where one player uh, is trying to guess a word that all the other players know. And those players are communicating their guesses to you simultaneously uh, with a one word clue. That's the name of the game, Just One. So say your, your word that you don't know, say, or say it's me, my turn, my word is pizza. I don't know that that's my word. You all have to communicate that word to me by writing on a little, uh, a little, little uh, whiteboard uh, a mat or a standee, you have to write a clue. And say two of you write down um, Italian the word Italian or the word pepperoni. If two people write the same word or more than one person writes the same word, before I even get to see those clues, you reveal those clues to each other. You find that you have a duplicate and I don't get to see those clues. And so in just one, you are trying to pick clues that, uh, that are either specific to the person that no one else will write down, but are still very specific to the, the word that you're trying to get the person to guess. And again, it's fully cooperative. You're not trying to mislead anyone. You're not trying to steer anyone in the wrong way or have one team do better than the other. There's no teams. Everyone's working together to try to get you to guess that word. Um, it, it is just a fantastic, fun game. I think it works well for, for any range of players. And uh, I think it's a great reminder to those of us who design games that cooperative games can be really simple, but really, really fun if you keep that cooperation in mind. And how, how are you working together with other players to achieve a common goal? Just one, I think it's a fantastic gateway game. 
At number three on the list, I have a two-player game because I thought many of these games can be played with two players, but I wanted a two-player specific game because I think that can be a great way to, inter to introduce a gateway game or a modern hobby game to a new gamer. Do just one-on-one, -on -one. no pressure, no pressure of other social expectations, just you and someone else. And my example of that is Patchwork. Because um, Patrick actually teaches some other things about modern games as well. Patchwork is a game where you are quilting. You are, you are laying tiles on a quilt. And as you can see, these tiles are Tetra-style polyomino tiles. And these are up here in a lot of different modern hobby games. And so introducing someone to these, this Tetris element, um, I think is really, really important if they, if they, if you, to see if they like that element, if they like this element of placing tiles of different shapes and getting them to fit together on a, on, a, on a grid, in this case a quilt, um, or if they don't, and then you, you know that, that, that that's not a style of game that they're going to pursue as they get into heavier games. There's also some nice mechanisms that, in terms of what your, your range of choices in this game. You're, you're always um, choosing one of three tiles, so you're not choosing from a million different things. There are just three different tiles that you can choose, and you're putting it on your mat. And there's also a nice sense of progression in Patchwork. Uh, because the certain tiles have buttons on them and whenever you collect income in the game you get more buttons and buttons are one of the currencies that you spend in the game in addition to time in fact there, there are so many clever mechanisms modern game mechanisms taught in a very very simple two-player game here that i think this is just a, a must-have gateway game if you want to inter introduce modern hobby games to new gamers that's patchwork at number two i have in fact, I'm going to end with two cooperative games here. One is super, super simple, and that is The Mind. In The Mind, uh, and I really love how this game ramps up. That's why it's particularly a great gateway game. In The Mind, in the first, in the first round, each player is dealt a card numbered somewhere between 1 and 100. There are no duplicates. Everyone has a different card. And in no particular order, there's no turns in The Mind, you are trying to play those cards without any form of communication in ascending order. So if I have the 10 and you have the 23 and someone else has the 47 secretly in their hands, we're trying to play those cards so that I play the 10 first, and then someone else, the 23 player plays their card next, and then you play the 47. We lo not lose, but we, we uh, lose a life essentially if we play those cards out of order. That's the first round. In the second round, each player gets, you reshuffle the whole deck. So you don't know anything about the previous round. You reshuffle the whole deck and draw two cards. So now you have two cards and you have to kind of learn each other's tendencies. Like how quick, if I have the 10 and you have the 23, how quickly did you place that 23? Did you place it right away or did you wait a little bit? Um, because you're trying to gauge uh, how other players act and, and, and respond in terms of the different numbers that they might have in their hand. And you're working together to do this. You're, you're all failing together or you're succeeding together. It's so simple to teach and play. So it's really, really su super simple to teach and play. It's fast, it's easy, easy to get to the table. And I, I think it opens the door for more complicated games because games have spun off from the mind. There's, the, there's Tranquility. There's uh, Groundhog Day as a new game that's spun off from this. So you can use this very distilled mechanism to introduce other games to people if they enjoy playing the mind. I, I love when a gateway game sp opens the door to specific other games in among the, the modern hobby games. The one thing this does that, that I wouldn't normally put on this list is hidden information. I think hidden, hidden information can be a slight deterrent for gateway games. And a lot of my honorable mentions have hidden information because you can't, it makes it a little harder to teach or a little harder to guide someone if they are hiding information or if they need to hide information for the game to work. The mind is so simple though that, that it doesn't really impact the, the experience of teaching this game. Um, let's get to the last game on this list. And this is just a fantastic game. So this is, this is Mysterium Park. Um, it's a beautiful game. It is super, super easy to teach and play. Uh, and I, I found that teaching new players Mysterium Park has them really actively thinking about their choices well after the game is done. The core idea in Mysterium Park is that a fully cooperative game, one player has died. They have been, they have been murdered. And they are trying to communicate through images um, uh, who did it and where it happened at this carnival to the other players. And so there's no talking. In, or that one player, the ghost player, is not... Uh, talking to the players. Rather, they are giving them these beautiful cards that you can see here um, to communicate certain things, essentially through their dreams is the thematic idea. They're, they're communicating uh, where the murder happened and, and who did it. And that's really the whole game. There, and But the nice thing about Mysterium Park, you may, you may have heard of a, a bigger game called Mysterium. It's essentially the same game, but the setup in this game is so much simpler, so much easier to get to the table, smaller box, 
and it's super, super easy to teach and play. Uh, there's no action checklist. You're always doing the same thing in the game. You're you are simply selecting some cards, giving them, them to a player, and that player is uh, selecting the their, their guess for, for what you're trying to get them to guess. Um, yeah, it just, it just works so well. And I like that it's a little, it's slightly heavier than some of these games in terms of what's in the box, all the different things that you can use and see and do in the game. Um, but it's still a very, very easy game to, to get to the table and to teach someone new. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I love Mr. Green Park. I think it is a fantastic gateway game. There are a few things that I wanted to mention that I, that I missed on this list. So if you're trying to design a gateway game, I mentioned some of these things, but uh, like I think the theme is important, the components are important. I think the lack of hidden information is important unless it's in the style of the mind where it's crucial to the game and is still very easy to teach around. Um, very easy to teach as you play. So you don't have to do a long rules explanation and then expect players to jump in. You can, you can teach a few core concepts and then start teaching as players are taking turns. A big one, this, uh, I'll mention the honorable mentions in a second, but a big one that disqualified some games from this list, in my opinion, were games with action checklists or games that ask players to remember things without the aid of a, 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 a reference sheet. Um, I, I, much, I say no, no action checklist because I, I think it just works much better for people to get into a game if they are not referring to a booklet or a notepad or something of stuff that they have to do. Rather, if those actions are built into the interface of the game itself. I think that makes it so much easier for someone to play. And so that disqualified, honestly, disqualified Pandemic. Um, Pandemic I, is, is, a, is a very great high selling game that is viewed i think as a gateway game by many people reasonably so but it uses that action checklist instead of incorporating those actions into the interface of the game itself um, which i it removes it totally for me for being a gateway game um, good for all ages that means typically not a lot of text for players to read um, oh I, one, one other thing is i tried to focus because this is the list of gateway games into modern hobby games i didn't count some slightly older games i'll mention them in, in a second also, uh, games that have decisions that you need to make before you even start setting up the game, before you even start playing the game, I think are not as welcoming to, to uh, as gateway games because players need to make a decision before they even understand the game, before they've actually done anything yet. There's a game on this list on the honorable mentions that I'll mention in a second that does that. Uh, I like when gateway games open doors to other games. And uh, yeah, and that's it. That, that's it for the types of things to keep in mind if you were designing a gateway game. Use a, a very distilled version of a mechanism to help players understand that other games use the same mechanism in more compl complex, complicated ways. So I'll end with my honorable mentions. Skull. Skull is a great game. I've played it at family reunions. We've, we've loved it, but I, it barely didn't make this list because uh, it does rely so heavily on hidden information, which makes it actually more difficult to teach. It's an, it's an awkward teach. Blockus. I love Blockus, uh, but uh, I chose another polyomino game. I chose uh, Patchwork, and Blockus is not a new game at all. Um, Scotland Yard, again, older game, would definitely be on this list otherwise, but it is a little older, even though it is still in print. Downforce is the game where you have to make a decision, a very important decision, at the beginning of the game. You choose your car and your ability. You can do that randomly, but it's actually like the bidding decision that you make there has a pretty big impact on your final score. So I think it's important that players make it and that it's not done randomly. So Downforce otherwise would be on this list. It's a fantastic game. Ticket to Ride, uh, Catan, Carcassonne, some modern classics, but I think... Uh, are, I think they're like Gateway Plus games. I don't think they're Gateway games. And Sagrada. Sagrada is a great game. It's a beautiful game. Um, but it, there's some awkwardness around where you are allowed to play Stice and where you can't play Stice. And I think that removes it for me from being a Gateway game and being more of a Gateway Plus game. That's my opinion. I'd love to hear your thoughts. If you have some gateway games that meet the qualifications that I mentioned here, or if you have certain things that you look for when you introduce a game to a new player. And obviously, I think the most important thing, if you have someone who wants to get into the hobby or is curious to play a modern hobby game, um, focus on them. Focus on what might intrigue them in terms of theme and mechanisms the best that you can, uh, rather than what you like. I think it's really important in that moment to focus on the other person, put yourself in their shoes and find something that they might enjoy getting to the table for 20, 30, 40 minutes. That's my thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks.